Turning your songbooks to song number 745, you can follow along either on the screen or in your songbooks for uh, today's song analysis lesson. That's what we're doing. It's near the end of the quarter, and so that's typically the time when I deal with things like this. And so the song that we're going to be looking at is titled Humble Yourself. It was written in 1978 by a man by the name of Bob Hudson. I was amazed to find out he was 12 years old when he wrote that song. Uh, and uh, how many of our 12-year-olds here have written songs that we sing in services? I think, I think one of our uh, uh, kids here are, are 12 or almost 12. Uh, that, that's quite amazing. It's the only song that we have that people know has been written by him. Uh, and he is still alive. He's 55 years old now. I could find no other information. He obviously follows his, his own song as far as humility. Some people try to self-aggrandize themselves or they become famous. It's not necessarily their fault, but they become more famous. They write more songs. This is evidently the only song that he wrote, at least that was published. But we sing it from time to time, Humble Yourself. The song itself is five verses and it is sung as a tenor bass lead and a soprano alto echo. And by that I'm meaning as to, the, the t if you don't know music, tenor bass is that bottom set of notes uh, when we have, uh, when we sing our songs. And the soprano alto echo is the top set of notes. I don't know how Bill's leading it today as far as which one he's leading, but he, uh, in, in songs like Our God, He is Alive, when you get to the chorus, the men usually sing the first part and the women usually sing the second part. Uh, and so that's what I'm talking about. The first verse is sung at the beginning and the end. And it is important that the first verse is sung at the end because the fourth verse is not a complete thought. Uh, and when you take a look at it, it's, it's one sentence, but it's not a complete thought. It's just stealing a, stealing a passage from a song, Amazing Grace. But verse 1 deals with the... The, the main topic of the title and it's humble yourself in the sight of the Lord humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up and he will lift you up and, and you can see that through each of the verses it's it you have two phrases and you're going to echo you're going to have them repeat twice it's the same with every verse verse two Jesus is the son of God Jesus is the son of God and he he died for us and he, he died for us. Verse 3, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. That should sound familiar because it's from the song Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. Verse 4, When we've been there 10,000 years, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun bright shining as the sun. And that is why the fifth verse is there, because that's not a complete thought. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And he will lift you up. Now, if you notice the song's progression, we start out with a directive to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and then the song moves on to tell us why it is important to do so in verses 2 and 3. Why is it important to humble ourselves? Because Jesus is the Son of God, and he came to die for our sins on the cross so that we can be saved, not based on our own merit, but by God's amazing grace. Verses 4 and 5 conclude then by telling us that even in heaven, we're not going to get to glory ourselves in ourselves for being there. For when we were there 10,000 years, it's eternity, so there are no years in a sense, but... 10,000 years are, are, is just a way for us to express an in, inexpressible time period for us. No one lives to be 10,000 years old, but eternity is forever. So that's why the phrase is used. It's a figure of speech. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we're still to humble ourselves 
in the sight of the Lord. And so in truth, this psalm really does give us the entirety of our belief as a Christian and how we are to live before God. And so let's look at each of the verses a little bit uh, closer. So we start out with uh, the idea that we need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what we have here is something that we need to realize is that arrogance is one of the sins that we face all of the time. And it is a hard sin to overcome because it's so easy to get sucked in by it. We can come along and say, well, I don't commit fornication. I don't commit adultery. I don't commit homosexuality. I don't do some of these things. I might have a problem here, might have a problem there. All of us are faced with the problem of pride. There is not a single Christian who does not face that problem. Lifting ourselves up when we don't have the right to do so. There's one thing between, uh, by uh, knowing that we have done a good job and people praising us for having done a good job. There's another thing when we come along and just glory in ourselves and our own, and our own self-righteousness, if you will, and think that we are higher, that we are uh, greater than who we are. You can listen to a person, and all they do is that talk about themselves. I'm this great person. I do this. I do this. I do this. What are they doing? They're, they're looking for praise, and they're lifting themselves up. And so we have to be careful of arrogance. In 1 Peter 5, in verses 5 to 7, there Peter said, Likewise for you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves into the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Notice what Peter says here about humility. We are not to wear a cape if you will, of humility, or a hat to cover our head in humility. We are to be clothed with humility. We understand what it means to be clothed. It is to be covered. We are to be clothed in humility. This idea about being humble before God is not new to Scripture. It's actually found in the Old Testament first in Proverbs 3, verse 34, where the writer of Proverbs says, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. So Peter is going back and borrowing from the Old Testament to show that we humble ourselves in God's sight because God is giving grace to the humble and not to those who are proud. But I am reminded when it comes to this about something that Jesus said in one of his parables in Luke 14. Luke 14, in verses 7 to 11, there he said, So he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and, he who invited you and him come to and say to you, Give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited... Go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus saw here that when there was a, a dinner feast, and if you don't know how dinner feasts work, uh, you can sort of maybe think like a wedding reception where... Who, who gets sat up at the front at a wedding? Well, you're going to have the bride and the groom in the wedding party. Who is going to get to have the first row right by the front? Well, it will be probably the family of the bride and the groom. Those are the best seats at one of those feasts. A lot of people who sit at the back, well, those aren't, those aren't the good seats. Now, we are used to assigned seats at weddings. You're going to go there, and you're going to look for your name. You're going to be told where you're going to sit. But if there wasn't no assigned seats, 
well, people might come along. Well, I want I want to sit up in the front. That's where the best place is. I get the best view. I might get to talk to some important people. So you go sit there, and then you find out that oh, that that spot was occupied. That spot really is for somebody else. Then by the time everyone else has gotten there, you got to go. It's going to be a big scene. People are going to notice because you're at the front in the best place. You got to go sit at the back. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Uh, at, at these types of feasts that the Jews were at, go sit in the lowest place. The way, if the master of the feast really wants you to sit up front, he'll tell you. He'll come to you and he'll tell you. Let him raise you up. Let him exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. And so that is true with God. Why should we humble ourselves before God? Well, there's really two reasons. One, we've sinned against God and have no right to stand before him proud. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 15, Paul said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. When Paul wrote that, Paul was a Christian. Paul was forgiven by God for his sins. But why did then Paul remember what he did before? So that he didn't exalt himself to think that he was any something by himself. He recognized who was the one who forgave him. It was God. He considered himself the chief of sinners because he persecuted the church. Paul knew where he came from. Knew what he was forgiven of. And therefore, recognized his place. So we humble ourselves before God because we recognize who we are and who God is. The second reason segues right into verse 2, which is that we have an example of Jesus. Jesus, as the Son of God, humbled himself. In Philippians chapter 2, in verses 5 to 8, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus is God. He always has been God. Jesus didn't give up being God to come to this earth and let no one tell you that he did. Jesus didn't become God while he was on this earth. So in other words, Jesus wasn't born and God saw him, you know, he's such a righteous man, I'm going to make him God. No. Jesus was God in heaven before creation. He is God today. When he came to this earth, he remained God. And that's the stumbling block for a lot of people. It's a stumbling block for the Muslims. It's a stumbling block for the Jews. It's a stumbling block for the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. And, and, and some others. And how could God come and occupy our human body? How could he do that? Well, God can because he did. God is all-powerful. Jesus is not a created being. He is not a lesser God. He is equal with God. And yet, Jesus humbled himself. That is the example we have. If Jesus, as God, certainly greater than everyone, could humble himself to come to earth to die for us, who are we to say, I can't do, I can't become humble? Who are we to say that? Why, though, did Jesus humble himself? Well, first reason, he loved us. In Romans chapter 5, and verses 6 to 8, Paul said, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love, own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for us when we were righteous. Christ died for us when we had no hope. Romans 6, uh, when we get, uh, if you continue reading on, we'll say the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus. 
everyone has sinned. Everyone is in need of God's grace. And as Jeff said earlier, Christ died for all. Doesn't mean all will be saved. Because all won't come to faith in Christ. But everyone has the opportunity to. And it is because God loved us. God could have said, no, man sinned. He is deserving of death. Therefore, that is what he gets. Or she gets. That is what we get. If you sin, you're worthy of death. I'm just going to cast you away. However, we were loved of God's creation. And God didn't want to cast us away. And Jesus didn't want to cast us away. So Jesus humbled himself, which brings us to our second reason. Because the shedding of the blood of an innocent man was required to save us. In Hebrews chapter 9, in verse, starting in verse 22, the Hebrew writer said, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered the holy place, sorry, Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. If Christ didn't shed his blood, we would have no hope. Now we can ask the question, why did he have to do that? That's an answer for God. God required. I don't get to tell God, why did you require that? God was the one who was sinned against. He gets to make the choice. When it happens to us, when we are in control, let's say we're a boss, and we come along and uh, you have an employee and the boss tells the employee, this is what you got to do. I don't know what it is, but you got to do it. And the employee comes along and says, but I don't understand. Why do I have to do it? Sometimes the answer is because I said so. We don't have to always know the why of why God expected this. Or why God needed this. The wages of sin is death. We can rationalize it from scripture. We can come along and say, well, the shedding of blood. But then you have someone who comes along. Why? Because God said so. That's why. And Christ knew that. And Christ accepted that. And Christ humbled himself. And because Christ humbled himself back in Philippians 2, we won't read it. But... In verses 9 and 10, we read that God exalted Christ. God was the one who raised Christ from the dead. He lifted him up to be king of kings, and every knee shall bow at Christ and say that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And if God, if God exalted Jesus who humbled himself, he will exalt us too if we humble ourselves. And the question is, how will he do that? Well... That brings us to verse 3. It's by God's amazing grace. We can all fall into the trap of thinking we can earn our way to heaven simply by filling out a checklist, if it were. I go to church, I give, I give uh, of my means, I eat the Lord's Supper, uh, uh, I'm, I'm charitable to the poor, uh, I, I do this, 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 and this, therefore, I'm going to heaven. Obeying Christ is not a checklist. Obedience is necessary for salvation. It is. But that's part of our faith. That's part of our faith. Doing what God says earns us nothing. We are still unprofitable servants because we have only done what God said. We can't do more than God said and expect God to somehow be indebted to us. Ah, I didn't tell you to do that. That was a great idea. All right, now, now you can get your way into heaven. Yeah, you didn't do these other things, but you did that one thing really good. We can't get our way to heaven by earning it. 
we have to respond to God's will, yes. But the only reason our faith is worth anything is because of God's grace. In Ephesians 2, in verses 8 and 9, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. He says something very similar in Titus 3, in verses 4 to 7, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now we need to make sure we don't go as far as many people go and say that we are saved by God's grace alone. No, Ephesians 2 says by grace through faith. God has done his part. We need to do what God has told us to do in faith. But the only thing that makes our faith active is God's grace. I can have all the faith I want. If God didn't extend his grace, I can't earn my way to heaven. I can't do it. God's grace is essential and just as essential as our faith. God will extend his grace to those who have faith. But our faith is only good because of God's grace. None of us are deserving of God's grace, but God's grace has the power to save each and every one of us. And it's going, it is going to be by God's grace that we're going to be able to be in heaven. Which brings us to verses 4 and 5 of our psalm. Talking about our salvation in heaven. In 1 Peter 1, in verses 6 to 9, Peter said, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be, found to be, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, he have, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is the end. We sometimes say we have been saved now. We have been saved from past sins if we become a Christian. But the mistake we can make is saying we're saved now. No, we have the hope of salvation now. What is that hope dependent on? Our faith. The end of our faith is eternal life. Why is that the end of our faith? Because when Christ comes, we will not have faith in him anymore. We will see him. Remember what Paul said at the end of 1 Corinthians 13? Now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest is love. We won't have a hope of heaven. When Christ comes again, we'll receive heaven. We won't need to have faith in God. Because we will see God. We will still have love. But we will not have faith anymore. The end of our faith is salvation. We have a hope of heaven now. But if our faith in God goes away, so does God's grace. Because that's how grace is received. The song began by telling us that we need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord so that he will lift us up. Eternal salvation is in heaven, and that is how God will lift us up. The question have, that some people have is, what will heaven be like? Oh, sorry, what will, what will heaven be like? What might it look like? We don't get much insight into that. But in Revelation 21, beginning at verse 1, we read, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sor nor sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. There's a lot we don't know about heaven. And we need to be careful when it comes to talking about the book of Revelation. 
that we understand what we're talking about because these are images, physical images about spiritual things. So everything that we read of in Revelation 21, we need to remember heaven is better. We only have them described this way because that's what we can understand. We talk about heaven having streets of gold or being with gold. Heaven's not going to be gold because gold is heat. Heaven's going to be better than that. We understand the preciousness of gold, the expensiveness of gold, the greatness of gold, if it were. Heaven's better than that. Heaven's not made with physical things. It's a spiritual place. We will want to be there. You want to learn a little bit more about it? Read today's bulletin. There still is a place called heaven. And we discuss it in that. So heaven will be a place where there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain, for those things will have passed away. There are families grieving today at the loss of loved ones. We have grieved here at the loss of loved ones. We won't have to do that in heaven. There will not be people dying in heaven. We will be with them forever. What a great blessing that will be not to have to say goodbye to anyone anymore. And to be able to see them forever. That's what heaven will be like. What will we be doing there, some people might ask. Well, we're in Revelation 22, beginning at verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be upon their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I want to really pick up verse 3, but... I felt like saying if I just pick verse 3, that's sort of in the middle of a sentence. But I want us to focus on that last phrase. His servants will serve him. We're serving God each and every day of our lives in what we do. If we are walking as a Christian, of course. We're serving God here. We don't just serve God on Sunday morning. Or if we come on Wednesday night. We serve God. We're to serve God each and every day. In the things that we do, we are to ask God, is this what God would want me to do? Is this going to bring glory to God? That's our attitude as a Christian. We want to serve God. And so if we're in heaven, we're going to be doing those things. How exactly? I do not know. We're going to be worshiping God. We're going to be joyful there. We're going to want to be there. Because the alternative is hell. And we don't want to be there. We serve God now. And like doing it now, in this world of suffering, pain, and death, how much more will we like it in heaven where those things have vanished away? But even when we are there, even when we are there, oh, that's not where I wanted. I thought I had one more there. We will still be humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord in heaven. Only this time, we're actually going to be able to see God for we will be in heaven as he has lifted us up there. But the only way to heaven is through humility. We have to give up sin. We have to serve him. There's no other way around. We sinned as a Christian. We need to repent of that sin. We confess that sin to God. And he will forgive us. However, if we're not a Christian, we haven't been forgiven of our sins. We need to humbly realize that Jesus is the only way. Only way to heaven. It requires humility to obey the gospel. It requires humility to recognize that I'm in sin and need of repentance. And since I believe in Jesus and his way, that and his way being the only way, I'm going to repent of my sins. It's going to take humility to confess that faith before others 
And it is going to be hum it's going to take humility to be baptized for the remission of my sins, trusting fully in God to forgive my sin. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord.